So today we're wrapping up a series that we started three weeks ago, and it's called So Much Blood. That's the title of the series that we're in, So Much Blood. And if you're here for the first time, I know this could seem a little odd, seem a little weird. Um, This is not a cult. We don't want any of your blood. I would like all of your blood to stay with you, so you're good, all right? What we're doing is is this entire year, we're, we're going through something we've called the whole story. We're exploring the entire story of the Bible. And obviously, in a year, we can't cover every single verse, we can't cover every single chapter, or really even every single book in the Bible, but what we're doing is looking at the the overarching story, the main moments, the main themes, so that you have the ability, at any point in time after this, to open up scripture and to understand the big picture. And we've made sure that every, every Sunday stands on its own, at least it should, so if you're here for the first time, you're like, oh, I'm way behind, no, no, every Every Sunday will stand on its own. Every series will stand on its own because that's the way scripture works. You could be someone who's never opened up a Bible. You can open it up to any random page and you will almost always find something meaningful, powerful, and go, wow, that's, I needed that. And that's just random. That's how powerful scripture is. But if you understand the big picture, if you do understand all the, the things that have happened and why they happen and what they're setting up and what it all leads to, You see Jesus more clearly than you've ever seen him before. It just changes what scripture can be for you. And so we're going through the the whole story and we happen to be in this section of the Bible right now that is very often defined by a lot of violence, a lot of war, and a lot of bloodshed. And so we've called this series, So Much Blood. I've really enjoyed the last few weeks. And by enjoying it, what I mean is I've actually had a terrible time uh, preparing each of these, because they're difficult conversations. Like this is, this is not the stuff that, that you just wake up in the morning, man, oh, I'm so excited to teach on these stories. These are my favorite, I love it when all those people died. That was a great story, that's my favorite part of the Bible, the death. You know, no, one, no one's sane, I don't think at least says that. But these stories are a really important part of the story of our faith. And as we kind of said last week, they're, they're not blemishes on God's resume. They're, they're not these moments in God's past that we kind of got to like, those are kind of ugly moments, but just skip them. They actually have a lot to teach us about the world, about ourselves, and about, about God. And even though we're a church that loves to have fun, right? We, we laugh together. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We also don't skip the hard stuff. And so some of these stories happen to be some of the hardest stories we have in scripture, but we've got to understand this because it's setting up Jesus in an unbelievable way. And the better you understand these stories, the better you understand why Jesus had to come and what exactly Jesus accomplished for us. And so we've looked at a few words. The very first week we looked at the word consecration and the word consecration, it means to make holy. If you consecrate something, you make it holy. And there was another word we looked at connected to that called atonement, and atonement's connected to that. It's, it's paying the price for sin, covering sin. Sin just being anything we do that is selfish and, and apart from what God would, would have us do. And we all, we all do that kind of stuff all the time. And in the ancient culture of, of the Jewish people, blood was seen as, as sacred because it was life. And so the way you would consecrate something is, is with blood. And so their worship involved animal sacrifices. So many goats died, guys. So you, to this day, goats still talk about the, the absolute horrific nature. Like at least we weren't born back then. Like it, it was intense because their main method of worship was animal sacrifice. And, and that wasn't just some barbaric, morbid thing, even though, yeah, in some ways it was because that was a long, long time ago. But actually it was constantly reminding them that, hey, sin is serious. We live in a world that likes to minimize sin. And I'll be honest, I like to minimize sin, at least my, I like to minimize my own sin. I like to maximize the sins of other people. I like to minimize my own sin because it always makes me feel better about myself. You know, that's a nice thing to do. No, in all honesty, we live in a culture that minimizes sin and God reminds his people, and it's just a constant reminder with all these sacrifices, sin is serious and a price must be paid. But obviously we know that that's setting up Jesus. And just like this little meal that we took, he became the sacrifice, he paid the price, gave up his life, died in our place, and now he has consecrated us, he has made us holy with his blood. Last week we looked at another word, conquest, conquering. 
There's a lot of stories in this section of the Bible, specifically toward the end of, of, of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers, and then you get into Joshua, Judges, when the people of Israel, not only have they escaped Egypt, now they're actually conquering the promised land. And in order to conquer the promised land, they've got to defeat a lot of tribes and nation states that occupy that land. And if you study history, you can learn that these are some of the most horrific, oppressive, evil cultures that have ever existed. They were powerful. It wasn't like the Israelites were powerful and these were the little guys, it was the other way around. And the Israelites have to go in there and they have to conquer the promised land and it is bloody and there is war. And that's a hard thing to, to wrestle with sometimes. I read a quote that summed it up pretty well. It said this, many cannot reconcile the problem of innocent people suffering violent deaths by the Israelites acting under God's orders. That sort of sums up a lot of people's objections to these stories in the Bible. Now, we could have a long conversation about the nature of what the word innocent means. If you know much about these, these cultures, innocent is an interesting word to, to use there. But I get the idea. I get the idea, like God tells his people, go and conquer and fight them. That's a difficult thing to, to wrestle with. We looked at a quote last week, and, and I think this puts it beautifully. As we studied all the nuances associated with those stories, it says most readers imagine that God commissioned his nation to vengefully wipe out an entire nation of Canaanite men, women, and children. However, a deeper reading reveals that the reasons for the conquest were more complex, the scope of the destruction was smaller, and God's mercy was present throughout. We went through a lot of that last week. I'm not gonna rehash all of it, but our basic takeaway last week was that evil is real. And evil cannot be appeased, evil must be opposed. And occasionally we do see things in our world today, a classic example we used this last week would be like Nazi Germany, where something has become so evil, so obviously, obviously evil, that you can't just sit by, stand by, and let it grow and let it solidify. It must be opposed, attacked, and that is a violent, bloody thing, unfortunately. But we understand that. And much of what was going on in this period of time has, has to do with those ideas. But today we're gonna look at a third word. And it's connected to this idea of, of why is there so much blood in this section of the Bible? And the word is cleansing. Cleansing. Because conquest is what you do when there's evil out there. There's evil out there and we've gotta go conquer it. Cleansing has to do with, with how you reconcile the evil in your midst because sometimes the evil is really close at hand. And that's what we're gonna to explore today. And I do wanna say after this week, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Way less blood in the weeks to come. Next week, we actually start a series called Messy Majesty. We're gonna, we're gonna really speed up the, the pace of the story of the Bible because that's what happens when you get to the kings. We're gonna cover hundreds of years of history and every single week is gonna be about as practical as, as you can possibly imagine. In fact, next week, just as a teaser, is all about how you can overcome the need to care deeply what other people think about you. Really interesting stuff. But today, we got more blood. All right. Cleansing. Some of the most challenging stories in the Bible have to do with, with not just the, the violence that happens to the people out there. It's easier to reconcile that. I think, well, yeah, they're bad. And so the good guys go and they fight the bad guys. But there are these stories where the good guys mess up. And their consequences, from our perspective, seem unnecessarily harsh. And these are, are really tough ones. And so if you've never read these stories, I'm just praying you don't have a crisis of faith while you're here today. But I, I think you'll be okay because I trust you guys. And more than that, I trust the Lord. Amen. Joshua chapter seven. Here's the setup for this. Um, the Israelites have entered the promised land. And the very first thing they have to do is they have to conquer Jericho, which was this large military fortress. And miraculously, it crumbles. And they win and, and they utterly defeat Jericho. And God tells them, hey, when you defeat Jericho, don't take any of their wealth don't take any of it as spoils. Not, like, not one person is to take anything of value and keep it for themselves. God doesn't want them to bring in stuff from, from that culture. Like that, that stuff is tainted. Like, no, no, no. Let it go, leave it. None of that is to be taken by you. But there's this man named Achan. And Achan can't help himself. He's part of the army. He sees some stuff and he, he wants it for himself. And because of that, 
God knows that. Achan's kept it secret, but you can't keep anything secret from God. The Israelites go into a battle with a much less powerful group of people than Jericho, and they lose. And Joshua, who's the leader of, of Israel, is like, something has happened. Like, how could we have lost to them after we defeated Jericho? What, what is going on? Has someone in our midst broken God's, God's command? And he, he comes to discern that it's been this man, Achan. And in verse 19, we find out what happens. Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession and tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. And Achan replied, it's true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with my silver buried deeper than the rest. So Joshua sent some men to make a search. They ran to the tent and found the stolen goods hidden there, just as Achan had said, with the silver buried beneath the rest. They took the things from the tents and they brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites. Then they laid them on the ground in the presence of the Lord. Then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, his tent, everything he had, and they brought them to the valley of Acre. And then Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burned their bodies. They piled a great heap of stones over Achan, which remains to this day. That is why the place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. So the Lord was no longer angry. Is this anyone's favorite Bible story? No? It's a tough one. Mm. It's a tough one. Let's go back and look at another story involving Joshua. Joshua was Moses' protege. And prior to this happening, there's this moment where Joshua gets to accompany Moses up a mountain where God's presence is there and they meet with God and God gives them what we would call the 10 commandments. And they come back down the mountain to find that while they were gone getting the 10 commandments from God, the people have decided to worship an idol, to create a, an idol, a false God. They make it out of gold. It's in the shape of a, of a calf, a young cow. And Joshua and Moses come down the mountain to find the people worshiping this false God after they've been rescued from their oppression by the one true God. It's a, it's a crazy scene. Exodus chapter 32, verse 17. When Joshua heard the boisterous noise of the people shouting below them, he explained to Moses, it sounds like war in the camp. But Moses replied, no, it's, it's not a shout of victory nor the wailing of defeat. I hear the sound of a celebration. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf in the dancing and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets on the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made and he burned it. And then he ground it into powder, threw it into the water and forced the people to drink it. Finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, what did these people do to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Don't get so upset, my Lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. When they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and out came this calf, which I don't think is actually what happened. <laughs> it's like, it wasn't me. Aaron's the one that fashioned it. It's like a kid being caught. You know, it's like we've all heard stories like this of your parents, but it gets, it gets crazy. Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control, much to the amusement of their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and shouted, all of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. Moses told them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, each of you take your swords and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other, kill everyone, even your brothers, friends, and neighbors. The Levites obeyed Moses' command and about 3,000 people died that day. Then the Lord told the Levites, today you have ordained yourself, yourselves for the service of the Lord, for you obeyed him, even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. Mm. So, and again, anyone's favorite stories? No, and I'm glad. I'd be so concerned if there was like smiles on your faces right now. And, and look, I gotta say this again. I am so grateful to be part of a church like this that, that can, can wrestle with these types of things because I want us to have a mature faith. I want you to have a mature faith. So many people struggle to really experience the blessings that God has for them because their faith never matures because they never grapple with some of the more 
intense and difficult concepts with God. And because of that, they, they just have a faith that doesn't solidify like it could. In fact, there's a story in the Bible of these, these young guys and they make fun of, of this prophet named Elisha who was bald, right? They make fun of him. They call him baldy. And then a couple bears come out of the woods and, and maul 42 of them to death. And I, at the time that, that I was the, the youth pastor here years ago, one of the students who happens to be here today, he's an amazing man, very mature in his faith, but he was young. He had just become a Christian and he read that story and he panicked because he's like, I don't like this story. He's like, Justin, what, what do I do with this story? Like, what's the takeaway here? And I'm like, it's clear. Don't make fun of bald people. Like, it's just, <laughs> I don't know how more clear, especially if they're prophets. Prophets are very particular about their hair. Like you gotta, you know, no, I, those are tough stories, right? And we've all had those moments. Maybe, maybe you haven't, but most of us have where, you know, we're, we're passionate about Jesus. We've experienced something in church. We've experienced the love of God. And then yet there's these stories, there's these moments and we go, oh, I don't like that whether it's stories like this or it's time, times where God says, hey, I don't believe this is good. I, I call this sin and it's, it's not to be dealt with, not to be touched. And yet it's something that maybe we're drawn to or that our world celebrates. And we go, ooh, I just, I don't like this stuff. Well, dealing with this stuff, wrestling with this stuff is how you get a mature, strong faith. It's like exercising. If you skip the hard parts, you never get to where you could be. And I can say that from experience. But if you want a strong faith, a mature faith, you gotta wrestle with this stuff because we find some really important truths here that we need to know. Now, if I wanted to like be God's PR team and try to soften the blow of some of these stories a little bit, there's things I could say. Like for example, when the people of Israel are, are going through the promised land, like it is hard for us to, to fathom the amount of trouble that they are in. They have no way in and of themselves to be victorious, to even survive being in the promised land. They are surrounded by powerful, oppressive, warmongering nations who want them dead. They are in danger. Their only hope is to do exactly what the Lord says. Imagine if, if you saw a parent walking a child through a very dangerous place. And you got to hear what that parent said to the child before they, they took that walk, before they tried to get from point A to point B and they've got to cross a really dangerous place to get there. And, and you heard that parent say, listen, you hold my hand. You do not let it go. You do not speak. You do not move away from me. You do not run. If you get more than three feet away from me, I swear when we get where we're going, you are in so much trouble. If you didn't know the context, if you didn't realize that they were about to go through something really dangerous, you would be like, that parent is nuts. Like that parent's crazy, what a horrible, harsh, mean parent. But if you understood that the child was about to go through something more dangerous than you could possibly fathom and that their only hope for survival was to stay close to their parent and do everything their parent said, that that was the only way they were gonna make it, you would actually look at that parent differently. Well, understand that that's what the people of Israel are going through in the promised land. They are outnumbered. They are outmatched in every way you can imagine. Their only hope of survival is to do exactly what God says because God is the one fighting their battles. Amen. They don't have any hope in, on their own. And maybe that understanding in that context softens some of the intensity a bit, but probably not that much. I could say things to you like, okay, well, maybe Joshua overreacted with Achan because you know, actually God didn't tell Joshua, kill Achan and all of his family. We don't have anything in that story where, where God says, you know, do that. In fact, you could argue that Joshua actually went against Jewish law to do that because Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16 says that parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children, nor children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. And so that's not what happens there. You can say, hey, Joshua, you know, he went a little overboard. And maybe that softens it a little bit. But then you have the story of, of the people of Israel and the calf. And then, you know, Moses says, this is what God says and whew, kill everyone. And I could soften that by, by like with numbers. I could say, hey, look, 3,000 people died. And we know from the biblical account that there were over 603,000 Israelites. So it was only less than half a percent that died, which is better, right? No. Like, if I was trying to, to soften the blow and to try to make this a little bit more palatable, there's a lot of things I could say. And some of them have validity, but I don't believe it's my job 
to make excuses for God. I don't believe any of us have to apologize for God. Because I think what we have to understand is that, and this is tough, it just is what it is. I don't know another way to say it. God's perspective is right and it is just and it is good. Scripture talks about God sitting on his throne and it says that his throne is both, it's both righteousness and mercy. We tend to, to favor one or the other. Like some of us are wired to be more merciful. So we're big on like, oh, just let him go. Just come on. Like what, maybe you're, if you're a parent, you have kids, like one of you is more mercy, the other is more justice, righteousness, you know? So like your kids play that all the time. They use that against you. And, and so my kids might come to me and say, hey dad, can we stay up? And I don't, know, I don't realize in a moment that they've already asked mom and mom has said, no, you're going to bed on time. And I'm like, of course, you know? Yeah, you guys have been great today. And she looks at me and I'm like, I didn't know. I didn't know, they, they outsmarted me. Like we tend to, to either be more about justice and righteousness or mercy, but God is both. And that's why when you read scripture, it blows your mind sometimes because you're like, God, why did you kill that person? That wasn't that big of a deal. And then in other times you're like, God, why didn't you kill that person? They should have died, like, come on. And it's like, oh God, God sees things differently. He's over everything. He's the one who has the say over life and death. And he has this perspective that unlike us is not one-sided. God sees things clearly. And so I wanna go back to this idea. I don't wanna soften the blow at all. I think the reason that there's stories like this that are so harsh and so intense is because evil is so harsh and evil is so intense. And so when you read stories of God coming into contact face to face with real evil, those stories tend to be pretty intense. A couple weeks ago, we, we talked about the seriousness of sin and how we have a tendency as people typically to underestimate the seriousness of sin. We, we just do. We look at a lot of things that God has said is wrong. We go, is that really that big of a deal? Like, come on, is it, is it really that big of a deal? And we don't often stop and, and consider the fact that maybe, maybe God isn't overreacting to evil and to sin. Maybe, maybe we underestimate it so much because we don't understand it at all, at all. Like, like imagine if someone didn't understand cancer for a moment. I, I've, I've known so many people who have gone through battles with cancer and I've seen what that's like at every stage. It's really difficult. But imagine if someone didn't understand cancer. Sometimes you can have a cancer that's so aggressive that a surgeon will, will need to amputate just to stop the cancer from spreading. If you didn't understand cancer, you would see that surgeon as a butcher, right? If they said, hey, we, we have to remove this, this limb to stop the cancer from spreading, that's how serious this cancer is. If you didn't understand cancer, you'd be like, what is wrong with you? Like you're a doctor. You're supposed to help them. You're supposed to heal them. And look what you've done. This is destructive. But if you understood cancer and the aggressiveness of it, you might go, yeah, right, let's do it fast. Because we understand that. Guys, cancer has nothing on sin. Cancer has killed far fewer people than sin. Cancer is far less deadly than sin. We just have this tendency to underestimate it. Like sin is serious, evil is real, and God opposes it. And sometimes when God opposes it, ooh, he opposes it from our perspective harshly, but maybe it's not God overreacting. Maybe we just underestimate the power of sin. It's interesting. We talked to, about this day called the Day of Atonement a few weeks ago. And it was a day in the Jewish calendar when they would celebrate and, and commemorate God's forgiveness. And there were, there were two really important animals that would always be part of the day of atonement. There was the sacrificial lamb that we learned a couple weeks ago. Really, Jesus becomes that for us, this spotless, pure, perfect lamb. And, and that lamb died as an innocent sacrifice to pay the price for the guilty. But there was also another, another creature, a goat, that would become known as the scapegoat. That's where that phrase comes from, if you're familiar. Levit Leviticus 16 
It says, when Aaron has finished purifying the most holy place and the tabernacle and the altar, he must present the live goat. He will lay both of his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion, and sins of the people of Israel. In this way, he will transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. And then a man specially chosen for the task will drive the goat out into the wilderness. And as the goat goes into the wilderness, it will carry the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. So on the day of atonement, not only did you have a sacrifice where a pure, spotless, blameless lamb would, would die to cover the sins of the guilty, right? The innocent dying for the guilty. We see Jesus in that. But you also had this, this other goat and it was like the sins of the people symbolically were placed onto this goat and then it was driven out as this symbol to the people that, hey, sin is serious and it's gotta go. We've gotta get this out. Have you ever had something in your life that you recognized was so dangerous that it just had to go? Like you had to get it gone, no matter what the cost. That's the lesson that God's trying to teach the people with this, that it's gotta go. I know for me, um, years ago, like 10, 12 years ago, I, I opened my back door and we've moved since then. We don't live in the same neighborhood as we did back then. So this house, thankfully I don't have this neighbor anymore um, as you'll see in the story. So I, I opened my back door and I, I step out and for some reason, I'll just give God all the credit for it. For some reason, before my foot hit the ground, I just looked down. And right beneath my foot, like this far, is a copperhead snake. And I'm this close to stepping on it. Now, you might say, how do you know it was a copperhead? Well, I happen to be an expert on snakes. No, I don't. Um, it's actually kind of funny because, and mom, if you're watching, I love you and I'm not making fun of you and please just, it's fine. Um, my mom hates snakes. Like anyone hates snakes, like they are the absolute embodiment of evil. And if someone tells you, well, some snakes are actually kind of good. You're like, no, all snakes are evil. All snakes must die. Like anyone have that view at all? A couple of you? A couple of you people who are sane and the rest of you are nuts? Have you seen snakes? Have you seen, no, I'm teasing. So my mom growing up hates snakes. And we used to tease in our family that, that every snake my mom saw was a copperhead. We lived in Southern Missouri. Copperhead snakes are the most common poisonous snakes in that part of the country. And so every time my mom would see a snake, she'd be like, it's a copperhead. And we'd be like, mom, that was not a copperhead. That's just a, that was, it, it was green. Copperheads aren't green. Like that was, she just thought every snake was a copperhead. That was the joke in our family. But because of that, I learned what copperheads looked like so that I could convince my mom that look, mom, that's not a copperhead because look at it, this is not that. And so I did become sort of an expert on what a copperhead looks like so I could convince my mom that every snake wasn't a copperhead. Well, this snake was a copperhead because I had spent a lot of time looking at pictures of those and I'm this far away from it. I step on it and I'm like, I shut the door, I back off and I'm like, Megan, go outside and kill. I didn't tell my wife to go kill it. I'm just joking. Wouldn't that be funny? I'm like, ah, baby, you gotta kill the snake. No, I'm like, what do I do? Like, what do you, what, guys, what do you do? When you, what, what do you do? You gotta kill it, right? Like that thing, it has to go. It's a poisonous snake. I have a two-year-old son at the time. And so I'm like, well, how do, you, how do you kill the snake? I've never killed a copperhead before. And so I, I got a shovel and I got a chair. Uh, this was my strategy. I, I slowly, it was a sliding glass door. I put the chair out slowly. Copperhead didn't move. I then step onto the chair. So I've got a real, like I got a, I'm from a high point. You know what I mean? Like I'm strategic here. I'm not stupid. I'm not getting on the snake's level. Come on. And then I took the shovel and I just like waited and I waited for my moment. Remember that children's story, Ricky Tikki Tavi back then? Anyone remember Ricky Tikki Tavi? If you don't, you know, it's a deep cut reference, okay? Like I'd watch that, like you gotta wait for the right moment to strike like that little mongoose in that story. And so I wait and I feel the moment. Guys, I just I felt it. It was like, it was like instinct from the hunter gatherer men of my ancestry. It was like now. And I just, pounced and missed, totally missed, <laughs> completely missed the snake. But now I'm on the same level and I like jump and it slithers into my neighbor's yard, right under the fence. So I'm like, it's, and it's one of those neighbors that you'd ever talk to. Like you guys have those neighbors. It's like a person like you should know their name, but you don't. You've lived next to them for two years, but you don't talk. And it was like one of those neighbors. And I'm like, well, I got it. What do you do now? You've got to tell the neighbor, right? How many of you be like, well, their problem. Anyone? <laughs> You'd rather let, you'd ra the idea of talking to your neighbor is more scary to you than the idea of them being bit like by a poisonous snake and you, it's your fault. So I go to the neighbor, I knock on their door. This lady comes, still don't remember her name. And uh, I said, hey ma'am, she looks at me real strange. Like, why are you here? And I was like, hey, this is real odd. I know, sorry, but um, there was a copperhead snake 
in my backyard and I tried to kill it, unfortunately, unsuccessfully. But it slithered into your yard and I just wanted you to know. And here's what she said to me. She said, oh yeah, I get those in my backyard all the time. And I was like, we're moving. <laughs> we're gonna move, we're moving. So now I'm like freaked out because I like, apparently this is a frequent thing for her and, and all our yards are separated by is this fence, which totally has the clearance underneath for multiple snakes to go by. I mean, fast forward a few weeks later, I go outside and I'm, I'm working on the, we have a really small backyard and there was this mat, like this little mat that was right off the patio. I lift it up and there are three baby snakes under that. And I'm like, that's it, that's it. And so I went on this quest, like this obsessive quest to snake proof my backyard and I'm buying mothballs, and I'm pouring like, I think it was sulfur or something that you buy and you pour it around. Like I look like someone doing pagan rituals in my backyard, like all kinds of craziness. I went and I got this like chicken wire stuff and I put it on the base of my fence to where like, I mean, it made sure that nothing could get through. I did it on both sides of my fence. I was that, I'm like nothing is getting, and then I had the panic thought of like, what if there's one in here and I've just trapped it? Like now it can't escape. That was, I actually had that thought because Here's the question, how many poisonous snakes are too many in your backyard? One. Correct, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of scenarios in life. It's like how many Nickelback songs are too many on your playlist, right? <laughs> it's one, sorry if you're a Nickelback. That's actually, that's for my wife who unfortunately is homesick today. I have this playlist from the 90s that I've custom created for years and it happens to have a single Nickelback song on it that I, I it, you're supposed to hate Nickelback, it's like a rule in life. And I just, I like this song. And so she's driving with me yesterday and it comes on and she went Nickelback and I saw her lose respect for me in the moment, in real time, my wife's respect level dropped. And I was like, I just, I don't, I'm not a fan of the band. I just like this one song. I think it's a good song. And then I skipped it on the playlist. One Nickelback song, too many, right? One poisonous snake, too many. Could it be possible that sin is such a destructive force that normalizing it, allowing it to grow, allowing it to exist, is like allowing a poisonous snake to take up residence in your backyard. Because you gotta understand the nature of sin. It never stops. It never says, you know, this is enough. It always, it's always more, it always progresses, it corrupts, it perverts, it destroys. Amen. It does. And this isn't just me saying this from, so, I'm, like I'm, I'm a pastor at a church and I'm, I got my Bible, which is on my iPad, so that's modern at least, and then I'm like, hey, sin's bad. No, no, like guys, I've experienced it in my life. Sin has destroyed so much in my life, the sin that I have tolerated and allowed in my own life. Talked about it a few weeks ago, the wages of sin is death. Sin will destroy your self-respect. Sin will destroy your self-worth. Sin will destroy your reputation. It will destroy trust in a relationship. It will destroy everything that it touches. That's why sin is death. And what God is trying to get through to his people is look guys, if you allow, if you allow sin to take root in your hearts, you, you have no hope. And he's telling the people of Israel, you're about to step into this incredibly precarious situation and your only hope is me. And if you begin to behave the way the very people that you're, that you're going against behave, if you're gonna worship their gods, if you're gonna live like they live, you have no hope because you're allowing poison in your midst and it will destroy you. It'll destroy you. So what do we do with that? Well, let's, let's just close right now. That's good. No, no poisonous snakes. No, what, what do we do with that? Because we all have sin in our lives and we, we all struggle with this or we lie. It's one of those two and lying is a sin, so it's the same. What do we do with that? Well, number one, I, I, I do want us to see the big picture and that big picture is Jesus. So it's interesting, right? You have the, the sacrificial lamb on the day of atonement, then you have the scapegoat and the sins of the people are transferred onto that goat. It's kind of a crazy thing, but but that's Jesus for us. Isaiah chapter 53 prophesies about 
about Jesus. And here's what it says. It was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. It's just like that scapegoat. Yeah, we all have it, but, but Jesus became that. He, he took that on himself. First Peter chapter two, verse 24 says that he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. So that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm so sorry, Second Timothy chapter two. It says, if you keep yourself pure, oh no, I just got way off. Don't worry about it, it's fine, we'll come back to that. It's not a sin to mess up when you give a message. I just wanna say that right there. It happens all the time. Jesus became that, he became that scapegoat for us. So the good news is if you're freaking out right now, if like Satan is making you feel guilty for well, all the sin in your life and does that mean God's gonna kill it? No. I've been, I've been here for 15 years, 16 years. I've yet to see lightning strike in the middle of a service because someone with sin was in our midst, okay? We live in a different era than the Israelites. We live on the other side of Jesus where Jesus has paid the price for our sin. He's become that sacrificial lamb and that scapegoat, taken our sin upon himself and paid the price. So we live in a, with a freedom that we should be grateful for because without that, we would have to toe the line. And so we have grace and mercy in a way that, that is so unique and special that we should just have gratitude in our hearts for that. But that doesn't change the fact that sin is still real. And so here's my, here's my, my main takeaway for today as we, as we wrap up, guys, Church, friends, family, I love all of you so much. Some of you I know way more than others, but I love you all. <sighs> Drive sin away. Drive it out. Do whatever you can to get it gone. That's what, that's what it means to cleanse. You gotta you got drive it out. Like when I recognized that there was a poisonous snake in my backyard and maybe it was even having babies, like, I, all that was in my mind was I gotta get this gone. I can't have this in my backyard. I can't have this in my home. And, and it pains me to know in my heart that I have not had the same mentality many times when it comes to sin in my life. Because I failed to see that it's the same thing. I failed to see that it's just as dangerous, just as deadly. And there've been moments in my life where I have allowed sin to take root in my heart. I've tolerated it. I've said, you know what? It's not that big of a deal. And I have suffered the consequences. And yet, I still, even on the tail end of that, have a tendency as a human being to want to underestimate sin. It is deadly. And we've gotta do everything we can to, to drive it out, to say, you know what, no, Jesus died so that we could be what? Dead to sin. And live for righteousness. Now we get to partner with Jesus. It's a process that the Bible describes as sanctification. You've been made holy by God. Now be holy. You've got to recognize that you've been made new. Scripture says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that you're a new creation. You've been born again. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. You are holy. He's made you holy, so be holy. What that means is that sin is not meant to have any power over you. That you can actually say, No, I'm dead to sin. I am dead to sin. I'm not immune to it. It can still affect me, but I'm dead to it. I don't have to do what my sin nature wants to do. I can say, no, I have a new nature. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me and I'm not gonna tolerate sin in my life. I'm not gonna do it. It's too important. That's what we're told so often in scripture. And this is what I got out of, out of order in earlier. <laughs> Let's go 1 John chapter 1, verse seven. If we are living in the light as God is in the light, in other words, if we're living in the light of Jesus, and this, this indicates that we partner with God in this process. This is a beautiful thing. It's God doing something for us we couldn't do, but now it's us living in this light that God has brought us into. We have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We're supposed to live in the light, not get used to the dark. We live in a dark world. We're not supposed to get used to the dark. We're supposed to live in the light. Second Timothy chapter two says, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean. You'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. 
Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. You're supposed to run away from the stuff that's, that's evil because it's deadly. Because it's deadly, because it kills. Hebrews chapter 12 says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he's seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people and then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. The worship team, if you guys would actually make your way out, that would be amazing. You've not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. In other words, what Paul's saying is, hey, as long as there's breath in your body, as long as there's breath in your lungs, fight against those desires, fight against that sin, recognize its danger. Yes, you're gonna fail. Yes, you're gonna mess up, of course. No, you don't have to strive and live perfect lives in order for God to to love you. You've already been accepted by God. You've already been forgiven by God. Now, because of that, be free. Don't tolerate sin. Like, again, how many poisonous snakes is too many? One. How much lust is too much? Any. Which is why scripture says that we're to flee from sexual immorality, that there should be not even a hint of it in our lives. That doesn't mean when there is that we should feel guilty and worried and fearful. It means that we got to go, this doesn't belong in my life. I'm a child of God. I've been saved by grace. Jesus died on the cross to to purchase my freedom. This doesn't belong in my life. This has got to go. Like how much greed, how much materialism, how much selfishness, Right? How much gossip, how much hatred. Jesus would even say how much religion. He said, be wary of the yeast of the Pharisees, meaning their religious hearts. Don't don't let even a little bit of it in your lives because yeast will corrupt the whole whole batch. Like, again, I'm not, I'm gonna say this and and we'll close. I don't always know how to close. I'm gonna say that. I'm, I'm bad at closing. I'm way better at opening than closing. It's like I'm better at reading the beginning of books than getting to the end. Anyone with me in that? Sometimes, guys, there's concepts and I struggle with it, and here's why. I I grew up in a church culture, and I love the churches I grew up in. I'm grateful for all of it, but I was part of a church culture that was very performance-based. And so messages like this would have made me sit in the crowd, and I would have felt so much guilt and shame for the sin that was in my life, and I would have walked away trying to make a deal with God, being like, God, please don't don't punish me. Please forgive me, Lord. I promise this is, I'm not gonna ever do that again. I'm not gonna ever do that again. And then like two days later, I do it again. And I had this cycle of just fear and performance. And it always, I don't want any of us to walk out of here like that today at all. You have been completely forgiven of every sin that you've ever committed or ever would commit. You can, you can if you've truly given your life to Jesus, like you've given your life, you've accepted him, There's not one mistake you ever have made or ever will make that's gonna change the way he feels about you. You are saved, you are loved, you are accepted. End of story, period, nothing can change it. No sin is better than God's grace. But, but, yes, yeah, we'll clap for that. Woo, Jesus, all right. But, God loves you so much. He does not want to watch your life suffer because of of a tolerance for evil. What what God shows us in these stories in the Old Testament, the reason there's so much blood is because there's so much sin and sin is death and God opposes it. And sometimes when you oppose evil, it gets violent. It's just the way that it is. And and fortunately for us, if we would go, does that mean he's violent with me? No, no, of course not. But the death of Jesus was violent. The sacrifice of Jesus was violent. And that's because that's how sin has to be dealt with. And Jesus willingly went through that. So because he's freed you, because he's forgiven you, don't don't let sin take root in your hearts. Don't tolerate evil in your life. Flee from it, run from it, drive it out. And when you need help with that, get help because you're part of a church. You don't have to do it on your own. Whether it's an addiction, just a bad habit, just something that you're drawn to, You don't have to live this life where you try to fight every battle in secret, feeling like a failure, feeling like you're you're messing up constantly. No, no, you you get to live life together with other people who have the same struggles, who can help. And so here's here's what I wanna ask as we pray. 
and close, I just wanna ask you to open your heart to God. This is not about guilt, this is not about shame, this is not about feeling like a failure. You are all, ooh, he loves you so much. But it is about recognizing that there's something in your life that doesn't belong. It needs to be driven out, it needs to be cleansed. And that's a process of the Holy Spirit. That's not you striving, that's the Holy Spirit working within your heart to reveal to you what it is that needs to go next and then strengthening and empowering you to actually get it going. Does that make sense? And so as we pray right now, open yourself to God. Say, Lord, is there something in my life that, that needs to be gone? And, and don't be surprised if something weird comes to your mind. You know, may, maybe it's just, like for me, there was a podcast that I used to listen to. And it wasn't even a podcast that anyone would think was bad, but I just, listening to it made me angry. I'd walk away every time I'd listen to it, just angry at the world. And I'm like, this needs to go. I'm not supposed to carry this kind of, it's, it's making me really, really, really not like people that I disagree with on certain issues. I don't need that. It might be something that small. It might be something really obvious. But all of it, it's the Lord loving you enough to say, I want you to be healthy and I want you to be whole. And I don't want this stuff to take root in your life. So as we pray right now, I'm just gonna trust that the Holy Spirit might bring something to your heart. And when he does, that doesn't mean you go, oh, I'm so sorry, God. No, it, hey, thank you, Lord, for bringing this to my mind. Help me, help me get this going. Help me drive this out. Cleanse me, cleanse me by your spirit. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, I'm, I'm Lord, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Jesus, that that you dealt with my sin harshly, but you didn't deal with me harshly. You dealt with my sin on the cross. And it was intense and it was bloody, but it wasn't my blood. Jesus, it was your blood. Lord, I pray that I never ever get used to that idea. I pray, Lord, that I never ever get comfortable and complacent and forget the intensity of the sacrifice that you made. And it was an appropriate sacrifice because that's how intense sin is. Jesus, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, you cleanse us from the inside out, that you come and you join with us and you make us new creations. And now we have a new nature where we do desire what is good and what is right. But Lord, we still have flesh and we still struggle with sin. And Lord, we pray that you would just bring to our hearts and our minds anything in us that needs to go, anything in us that needs to change. And that we would be people who are so in love with you, so dedicated to you, so grateful to you, that we would say, yes, Lord, if you call us to let it go, we'll let it go. If you call us to drive it out, we'll drive it out. We will not tolerate it. We will not let it be. We won't let it make its home in our lives because it doesn't belong in us. We have been made righteous by you. You've made us holy, Lord. Help us take that seriously and deal with whatever sin is in our lives. It doesn't belong there and we don't have to be a slave to it. So give us strength, Lord. Give us courage, give us power. Lord, the power to fight. Not to be overwhelmed by guilt or shame, but give us courage and peace to enjoy the freedom from sin that you have won for us. And if we need help, Lord, help us seek out the help. We pray this in your name, Jesus, amen.